And for the for the third time, welcome to those in the room <laughs> to this session on <laughs> AI and machine learning. Uh, I'm Breno Horst, working at the HIS Center at the University of Oslo. I have the pleasure of simply hosting this session with Elmarie Klassen from HIS South Africa, Bahid Rostami from Macarize, who will be presenting use cases for uh, using the HIS2 data and integrating with these uh, uh, new methods. So I will just give the floor directly to Bahid. Please welcome. Hey, hello from my side as well. Can you hear me well? Okay, hey. So uh, thanks, Breno. Uh, my name is Vahid Rostemi. I'm a machine learning scientist at Macrorize. So I'm a very technical person, but I will try to keep the talk as non-technical as possible. So I'll give a short overview of Macrorize and who we are, and then I will try to explain a bit what is AI and machine learning, and hopefully demystify the this buzzword that you hear all over and hopefully keep you until the end of the talk, because also a perfect time probably for a short nap after lunch. <laughs> and then uh, I will go to one of our use cases in Sierra Leone when we work on forecasting essential medicine and uh, vaccine. Uh, yes. So Macrorize is an AI company, and uh, our vision is to create more from less by making pervasive system intelligence. And we are working towards a world where nothing is wasted and where each resource has generates the greatest impact and is only possible by using AI. And, and you will get to know more how this is possible later. And also our mission is to extend what is possible with finite resources, solving the global problem of ethically matching supply to demand and also this brings us this uh, kind of big challenges of adopting whatever ai and machine learning uh, methodology exists out there to be adopted to the low resource setting so i will talk mainly about our work in global health but we are working in transforming supply chain in uh, basically every type of supply chain in agriculture environment in education and, and in industry. So Estriata is our core product and is a platform that, that I will go to it in the next, next slide, showing you the, what are the functionality of our product. But here is a map of the deployment that we have with different government in, in, in the, across, so, the, so in Africa, Asia, and also United States. And in dark blue, you can see our staff that is actually also distributed all over the world. And we are a fully remote company. So, so Estriata, as I mentioned, is a, is a platform and it's our core product and it has three pillars. So Estriata infrastructure, Estriata forecasting and Estriata uh, behavior. So Estriata um, infrastructure tries to answer simply the question of what is there. So if you think of, uh, for example, a map at the national level, so what, what Estriata provides you is that you can zoom in in this map, go to the health facility level and, and see what is there, what is in the shelf there, like both in terms of staff and also in terms of material which are there. And also it, it gives you, a, a on top of that, it gives you a kind of optimization a strategy to how to redistribute the, the resources which are there to, to actually use them efficiently. And the Estriata forecast tries to answer questions like what's needed, where, and how, how much. So basically it gives you a number that what is the need of a specific products that you're looking for in next month or next quarter or next year. And, uh, and Estriata behavior tries to answer questions like who will show up for care and who won't. And this actually gives you a, a good understanding of that who, for example, is the patient who will drop out from medication and you can, or will be a loss to follow up. So basically combining all these three together, we can have this comprehensive solution that at the end helps the decision maker to, to, to decide how to allocate resources. So now just talking a bit about the, so the, the name of the session is AI and machine learning with DHIS2. So you all know about DHIS2. I'll try to explain the, the 
what is artificial intelligence versus machine learning and what is the so deep learning maybe some of you heard about so artificial intelligence is the, i think terminology existed forever even uh, I think pre-Socratic philosopher talk about, or even Greek mythology. And the idea is to create intelligence, which is artificial. So mimicking human intelligence, but making artificial uh, kind of version of that, which can be outsourced uh, uh, and kind of come up with some limitation that human might have. And there are different approaches people followed in, in artificial intelligence and machine learning is one of them, which been quite successful in last decades because of the power of computation which grew and also because of uh, different uh, approaches that developed by, both in academy and industry. And, and the, the idea there is to learn from data without uh, explicit instruction. And then within the machine learning approaches, the one of the most successful one uh, in the, re the recent decades is the so-called deep learning where you, when you use a neural network, which is inspired by human nervous system and is only inspired because it's still far away from how the real brain works and but it's been quite successful in solving real world problem now the example i want to talk about is that so what are the potential of ai solution compared to traditional solution i think most of you are familiar with many different types of solution you develop for your problems in in more classical settings and I want to hear now compare what, what AI gives you compared to that. So if you think of traditional solution, usually you have a problem. So you try to find solution for that. So you define some rules and then you can combine the data you have with some rules. Then you get some outcome. And based on that outcome, you try to make decisions. So you can think of like an Excel sheet you have and some like an operation you do between your columns and, and rows and get one number and then make decision with that. The characteristic of this type of solution is that it's a static. So as far as the rules are fixed, the outcome is always the same. Eventually, over time, the error increases because outside world is changing, but the rules you put in are fixed. So, so the error that you make with your solution goes up. It needs perfect data. So even if you have a perfect rules for your problem and the data is noisy, you will get a bad outcome. And these kind of solution become obsolete very fast, because as I said, the outside world is changing. Unless you are changing your rules constantly, this kind of solution doesn't work. On the other hand, with AI solution, what we do usually is that, first of all, when there is a problem, for example, in global health, we talk to the expert in the, in the domain. We just gather some prior knowledge of like what is the problem limitation. And we don't need the exact solution, but we just need some prior knowledge. We combine this prior knowledge with the data we have at hand, and then first we just let the, the, the methodology that we, we develop to infer the rules. And then based on those rules, we try to do prediction. And as the new data comes, we constantly improve our prediction. So a characteristic of this type of approach is that, so it's dynamic. As the, the new data comes, the, the, the prediction you make constantly is improving. The error eventually decreases because the algorithm you have at place actually like learns from the new data which is coming and also it doesn't need perfect data and this is also one big uh, direction also at macro is we, we have to really like come up with solution how to impute data how to deal with missing values and grow like an intelligent solution to deal with that and also the important part of that is it's adaptable and uh, to just summarize this slide, I think if you think of pandemic as a good example, when the pandemic hit us all globally, what happens with the, with the traditional solution is that the, so the outside world, the pattern, the demands, everything changes, like hospitals are occupied for different reason, but the rules you have for your solution are still fixed. So you start to make like a really big error on, on, on the outcome you have. But what happens with the AI solution is that at the onset of pandemic, you make a big error of how you observe the world, but as the time passes in the course of days or weeks or months, the, the, the algorithm learns from the now new rules which actually exist in the outside world. So it will correct the, the error it makes. Okay, so now uh, I wanna go to the, so one of the use cases of our product that we grow and, and also deployed in, 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 in Sierra Leone, working with the government of Sierra Leone and MOHS. And uh, so, I will focus on the forecasting we had there, but also just want to mention that we also have a HR optimization tools where basically we 
we we we we kind of like develop solution how to uh, basically like re-staffing the the different health facility to make sure that uh, all the medical cares are are supported. So so for forecasting, what we did was that uh, talking to the government, we we got a, uh, we got access to DHIS two data. So so our engineers developed like an API to to connect and pull data from DHIS two, and then. We, we also agreed with the government to, to focus on eight essential medicines that they had. And the, so the, they told us to work on and three types of vaccine. And what we did first was to looking at the HIS2 data and come up with the, actually like a measure of what is the error in place. Like right now, how the system that works, what kind of error the system makes. And we use the three months rolling average for forecasting, which means that we look at the three, last three months consumption. I use that as a forecast for future. And that was the baseline error that we defined. And then we developed our solution. And here I just show you the result. And then I will go to the details of the challenge and solution we had. And we could show that depends on the, the type of products we were looking at, we could manage to improve the, the forecasting error by 34 to 59% for essential medicine and 56 to 89% for, for the for vaccine. So now like uh, starting with the data, so DHIS2 data that we had, we did some quality check of the data. And here I wanna show you the, the I think this, this plot is, here shows you that the, the, all the data we had. So we, we had data from January 2019 to January 2022. And on the y-axis, you can see the, the percentage of missing values in this data. So, so in 2019, we had like more than 80% missing value. It got better like in 2020, but it always stayed around 40%. And, and this is, I think, for, for whoever is doing forecasting, is a quite big challenge to, to manage to improve anything with this type of data. And also underneath, I just want to show you two examples of the, the data we had for, for th those who've seen uh, time series before to have a better understanding of what type of time series I'm talking about. So here you see on the left and the right, uh, in the bottom, you see the two different types of medicine at one CHP. And on the x-axis, you see the time, and also the y-axis shows the, the consumption over, over months. You see that there are a lot of missing values. Also, the other interesting thing in this data is that there is a lot of zeros. There are like 20% zeros in this data, which are not the real uh, uh, consumption. So that's what we call false zeros, which could be a human error, or sometimes there was a, so the, the missing values, and they just replace it by zero. And we had to also come up with some strategy to detect those zeros because they all influence the, the, the whatever prediction you want to make. The, so yeah, so, so the solution without going to the technical part of that, whoever is interested would be happy to talk about it afterwards. But what we do is that for forecasting, usually if you think of like, when you want to forecast for one variable, you can think of like, for example, for weather or stock market, Usually you need a historical data. You look at your variable, how it was behaving in the past, and you try to find some patterns like some trends or seasonality or some autocorrelation in, the, in, the, in the, this variable you see. And based on that, you try to, to uh, predict the future. And this is what people call like univariate forecast. And if you have multiple variables, what we can do is that not just looking at one variable itself, but you can look at the correlation across them and see that, for example, if the future of one variable can be detected or forecasted by, by looking at the others. And these are like, there are methodology already out there, but all of them needs long historical data to be able to, to have a good forecast. However, in our case here, I'm just showing you four variables. We had 9,000 variables, so we had eight for essential medicine, we had eight uh, products and we had around 1,200 health facilities that we wanted to forecast for. So we had more than 9,000 of these variables that I would call time series. And also we didn't have a like a long historical data. So per time series or per product at the facility, we had on average 10 to 15 samples. And this is, I think, for those people who work in the forecasting, they know is a kind of like, quite impossible to do any type of forecasting in this. So what we did was, first of all, we, we developed quite different strategy to, to create more from the data, which is in, at hand. So created different features from this data and also try to 
not only focus on the DHIS2 data, but looking at the whatever publicly available data out there, like satellite imagery, web scraping, whatever could, that could be correlated with the consumption that we have at hand. And then also looking at all these nine time series at the same time, try to find uh, whatever like different order of correlation that we can find in this pattern across different facility or product to help our, 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 our prediction. And these are all done with the so-called supervised learning or machine learning approaches that, that we developed at Macrise. Going to, to now to the, to, the, to the results, I want to show you. So what we did for validation is, the, is that we kept the last three months of the data from DHIS2 as a test set. So we put it like aside. And then we trained our model on the rest of the data. And then we asked, so first we look at the baseline. So the baseline, as I explained, was this three months rolling average. And we asked like, what is the error if we use this three months rolling average? And this is what you see in red for each product. So for example, for amoxicillin, here you see that if you use three months rolling average, we get around 69% error. And in green, you can see our error. So if you use Macroy's uh, solution, we get 37%. So we had like around 46% improvement for, for this product. And, and of course, depends on what product you have, we managed to, to, to improve the, the forecasting error between 34% to 59%. So for vaccine, we, we, we use actually very similar approach, but here we had another prior knowledge. Let's say that's what I meant that talking to experts in the field that we knew that consumption of these three vaccines are actually very similar. So when, when they're at the facility, they use one type of vaccine, very highly likely they use also others. So we use this knowledge to first impute the data and then actually following very similar approach we had. And also, I just have to mention, I don't have a figure for that, but in vaccine, the missing value percentage that I showed at the beginning was way lower. And that also helped us to, to actually, to the improvement that we, we managed to have here was, was drastically better. So we, here we had like between 56, 6% to 89% improvement for, for, the, for the vaccine. So, so uh, now I wanna actually like, tell you like what are these percentage means so so i'm talking about 56 percent error what does it mean in quantity so for example if you think of vaccine so here for example i'm showing bcg vaccine if the for example mohs wants to actually like has hundred thousand vaccine wants to uh, distribute if if they dis make decision based on three months rolling average what would happen is that they would have plus minus sixty four thousand error to the kind of like the quantity that they distribute. But if they would use the macro is forecasting, it will actually goes down to 7,000. So, so you can see that depends on the total supply that you have, you can have actually like quite drastic improvement of the wastage that, that, that you might actually have. So, so actually that's what I wanted to share. To sum up, I wanna just mention that, so all our effort is actually bringing AI in the and actually adopt all this methodology to be applicable in one of the actually most difficult and poor data uh, environment and this needs a lot of actual research and also practical work so we work with the also different university we have like research direction which tries to re-adopt all the machine learning techniques which are out there and normally actually are very much optimized for big data or, or for organization that they have a lot of data but we really try to get this methodology, try to adapt it to be applicable for low resource setting. And I just wanna finish by, by this sentence saying that I heard a lot from many people, especially in global health sector, that we don't have data to do machine learning, but, but I just wanna uh, say that this is exactly what we are doing. We really try to revisit all the methodology out there to be applicable. Even in this example I showed you, we, we managed to, to improve the, the, the forecasting quite a lot. Thank you very much. Okay, now I want to welcome Danielle Marie and Sean from Good Health Africa.
Am I on? There's a switch. Um. Yeah, I think once you display, you can switch. I think so. Uh, swap displays, yeah. Top top left. Third icon from the right. One across, yeah. Right. <clears throat> okay, should we get started? <laughs> right, let's, I'll start down here. Hi, everyone. So I've had the privilege of working with Amri for, for many years. Um, she tends to take my job over time and does better than me and leaves me with quite little to do. Um, so I'm going to kick it off and then hand it over to her. So there are two sort of fundamental misconceptions around data science that we picked up over the years. And by data science, I mean AI and predominantly machine learning is the space that, that we're in at the moment. And the first misconception is that it's mainly wealthy countries, wealthy settings that should be doing AI and machine learning. And they're gonna, they're gonna benefit the most and, and they should do it. And what we're finding is that's fundamentally wrong because AI, and I think you started seeing that in the previous presentation is, is most useful for resource constrained settings, which is actually all of our settings in reality. I don't think anyone here would feel they're in a setting where there's too many resources, but particularly in some of the countries like African countries where those resource constraints are so, so severe. The second misconception that we've picked up over the years is that other people are doing this really well. There are brilliant people out there that are doing data science in health so well, don't even bother getting into it. And that we've also picked up is fundamentally wrong. And those of the few that are following some of the research that's come out of after COVID and the, some of the meta analyses on the machine learning work that was done in COVID has found that actually this is a very messy space that's not done particularly well. Um, and that the strong use cases that are being done well are very, very few. And so it's a space that we decided actually probably is worth in get, getting into. So those are general misconceptions. I'll tell you about some sort of more personal mistakes that I've made along my career that I think also helped to make the point here. So I started as a medical doctor in early 2000s. And one of my biggest frustrations working in South Africa, particularly as I got out into the more rural settings was, wow, health sector is a bit of a mess. We don't resource very well. We don't plan very well. We don't manage anything very well. Maybe I should get more into public health. And I started moving into public health and public health informatics and started looking at the sort of data that we had available to make decisions. And I realized, wow, the data is not very good. So maybe what we should be doing is working more in digital health, health informatics, and starting, let's generate better data. Because if we've got better historical data, we can make much better decisions. And I've probably spent a decade doing that kind of work. And what we've learned is that our historical data is not usually that useful and that valuable because it, it doesn't tell us that much about what we're currently experiencing. And so coming full circle, it's starting to get us really excited about the world of data science and, and machine learning, because if we can have improved our, our systems and have better quality data coming through, but then we can work with it in a new way, in a more predictive way, we, we may start getting to a point where I'll start feeling, okay, well, this, this, is, this is looking better. Anyway, so that's about me. Um, let me push some buttons here. So we, we were going to spend some time talking about terminology, but our, our colleagues dealt with a lot of the terminology, so we, we won't worry too much uh, about that. Um, but for those that are new in this space initially, and certainly um, we found that as well, is there's a lot of language being thrown around. 
Um, but fundamentally, what we're talking about when we talk about data science is AI and machine learning and much more towards, towards machine learning. Um, so this is what we're going to cover, cover today. So this is a picture that uh, some of you probably know very well. And, um, and it talks a little bit about that cycle that's, that I was referring to, but it's about how we, as we can start doing more things with data, we can generate information, as we can start being able to share that information and internalize it and then push it back and share it back to other people, then we start moving towards this knowledge space. But what we're really trying to get is to get beyond that and get back down into, into the inside and what some people talk about wisdom and, and get more predictive um, around there, understanding what it's really saying about our environment and then actually use that to take decisions that then have an impact on our environment and from a healthcare point of view actually start generating those benefits that are, are pushing back to health system changes health output changes lower maternal mortality better infant mortality how can we make those sorts of decisions that's what we're actually actually going for and in the dhis world as you progress along your dhis maturity you move from there and you can start feeling the improvements and get really excited but while you're still in that top sector you probably haven't generated any health system output improvements or out, out, outcome improvements. And that's, and that's one of the big problems is we, we, if we get stuck there, we're spending more and more money, more and more resources are being sucked into this information space around trying to make better decisions, but we're not improving the health of our populations. We may not even be improving the health system much, but we need to get down to this space where we start seeing those, those decisions becoming more productive and actually driving the, the outcome changes around impact. So a little about a bit about his and by his at the top we mean his South Africa's journey. So in 2016 we started getting exciting excited about this because we realized okay we're not so far behind. There are not a lot of smart people doing this brilliantly, so we shouldn't bother. And and maybe it's worth it for for our setting. So we got past some of those early misconceptions. And we created a, a data science unit within HISP. It had no staff, it had no projects, it had actually no know-how at all. But we decided, let, let's make a start, we'll create the unit. And we were faced with our first use case challenge, which was South African government wanted to allocate 14,000 health professionals a year. So that's medical interns, medical doctors doing community service training, nurses, pharmacists, a whole lot of people where government allocates them specifically to facilities. And the political mandate or, or reason for that is to get more equitable distribution of these junior professionals in a way that should help transform the health system. If you can get those junior professionals to start going out to more rural settings and the less attractive facilities in a more equitable way, you should start balancing some, some system, uh, system issues. So that was the challenge that we were faced with. And we said, well, goodness, how on earth do we do that? And we discovered this was actually a data science challenge. And, and how we put together algorithms and we, how we start understanding those individuals, collecting information from them to say, well, okay, you 14,000 people, where would you like to go? Then could we introduce some incentives to say, well, if you go towards those less attractive facilities, we'll introduce some incentives. So if you choose a less attractive facility in your top five choices, we'll guarantee you get it. But if you can only choose the really attractive facilities in your top five choices, well, you know, you take your chances. You may end up somewhere else. So those are the kinds of discussions we started happening with the Ministry of Health. And how do we put those into some kind of a tool? And that's when we, that was the first challenge that was put to, put to our team. Anyway, just a little bit of a history. We're going to get into some different use cases now. And it was as we got into that where we started realizing we need, we need to start appointing some people that really understand this space. And we appointed our first data scientist in, in 2019. And then some more use cases started coming along. And these, they're four that we're going to get into, into a moment. Um, and I'll be handing over to, to Elmarie because then that, you know, that gets to the tri tricky stuff that I have to give to her. Um, I think this is probably the time, hey? <laughs> Good. Yeah. Yeah, so you. I'm going to take you through three um, very high level use cases that we have and then one into a bit more detail just to show you the kind of things that we are working with. So we have a project project um, with Africa CDC looking at event-based surveillance. Event-based surveillance is 
um, sort of outside of um, integrated disease surveillance where event-based surveillance looks at um, events that is not specifically reported or diseases that is not specifically reported. So you're looking at um, events that comes from social media or from the media um, kind of thing. And I'm going to go through four steps in my three use cases to how we identify, improve, innovate, and impact um, um, on uh, in, in these use cases. So what we're looking at here is to use EpiTwitter. It's a WHO uh, product that sort of uses natural language processing to um, I identify so you can add in tags like say COVID, um, Ebola or whatever, and then you get all the tweets that has happened about that. Now, for me to say I'm sick and tired of reading about COVID, that doesn't mean it's an event of COVID. It's just my sort of frustrated tweet uh, on, on social media. But if you were to say that, um, um, you know, monkeypox happened in a specific country, um, that might actually be something that is not yet um, picked up. And the challenge that the epidemiologists at Africa CDC have is that if you were to look at, say, um, even a thousand tweets a week, um, for them to go through all of those, um, it's a lot of human capital that is spent on just figuring out which is real events that they need to respond to, never mind then going to respond to those events. So what uh, we can do is to pull all these events, we can get the thousand events from EpiTwitter, but what we then need to do is to, um, uh, we uh, are refining the output through a machine learning process to identify which is exactly those um, tweets that are likely to be events. So we perhaps give them a, a hundred to look through and say, are these real events? And then if they are, then we post them into the DHI system through um, the, the events that we have pulled. And then hopefully over time, we're going to learn from those hundred that maybe um, 60 of them were not real events and we learn how to better present them with a lesser um, a, an amount of, of uh, possible what they call signals that could be become events. So that is just a simple um, use case we're working on. Um, then the second one may be a little bit more interesting for the DHIS2 community. There is something like predictors in DHIS2 and I know it's very much used. Um, the challenge that we have with predictors in DHIS2 is that you must select a certain algorithm, either exponential, logarithmic, and sometimes facility profiles and the data in facilities are very different. You might have a small facility that we looked at this uh, specifically for um, sort of uh, HIV patients and care, and looking at how do we increase the patients in care for 95, 95, 95. Now, certain facilities are increasing their number of patients. Other facilities have a different process where, uh, where you might have started treating those patients in hospitals. Now you're looking at them uh, treated more in, in primary healthcare facilities and hospitals are going down. So using one algorithm is not always um, giving you a, a correct um, um, uh, uh, solutions there. So what we have done is that we developed a best fit algorithm for um, running this at every facility level and determining the algorithm that needs to run, uh, that, that you need to use to predict that in, uh, for each facility. Um, and then um, what we're uh, doing is to link that to a machine learning process. Um, it is quite processing heavy, so we're running that in a, a machine learning um, application, um, but pulling, uh, then also developing a DHIS2 front-end application that you can select which um, uh, elements or indicators you want to run it on. It runs it in the machine learning um, application and then would post it back into DHIS2 prediction uh, for, uh, into data elements. And then um, essentially, we see a lot of use case for this in terms of predicting targets, predicting um, in ideas or perhaps thresholds, 
that you you would want and essentially hopefully um, we can very soon contribute this to back to the community as a solution that you can uh, use with the app um, and we will see how do we implement the ML solution. Most likely it would be something like a Python server that we can uh, give you the, the whole process if you can install it. If not, um, we can run it as a service or something like that. And then health workforce modeling is the other big uh, case that we have. So uh, you, many of you might also be aware of the Wizen model to where you look at how many um, uh, doctors should you have based on population, 10 doctors per 10, uh, 100,000 uh, population, so many nurses and so on. But what we found in South Africa is that those norms are not always practical for the Ministry of Health to implement. And how do we develop a scientific model for health workforce modeling in terms of how many staff do we need? So we have developed this looking at a specific WHO and South African norms for predicting. Uh, uh, and we used one district as a proof of concept. And now um, we are busy refining this ML model and uh, build, to build a planning model. And, and then also what we're doing is to build a front end on um, a module that gives would give the minister, ministry options to do scenario-based planning. Um, so if I uh, tweak the, the norms to from 10 to, um, to nine doctors, then what, does, what would that output be? Um, if it is an epidemic, then how many ICU beds would I need and how many ICU trained staff do I need versus maybe a non-epidemic um, scenario and, and things like that. So, um, and then, uh, you know, it's really to be able to add that value add. Yes, we have HR data. We know how many data there is. We have indicators, but we don't have this type of intelligence in terms of um, helping them to say if this, then what, you know, and, and what is the, the, how can we help you make better decisions? What is that uh, question that you really need answered um, on, on that level? So this is just some of our workforce models modeling results we're looking at it over uh, headcount as well as population base um i'm not going to go too much into this because i do want to um but you can see basically here uh for a, and, and it's also in south, oops, sorry in south africa it's very much about equitable distribution there are areas that has historically got enough staff and more than enough staff and other places that have got a lot less staff and, uh, and and patients are really struggling. So you can see here that we're actually coming out with a surplus and shortfall or a gap in terms of the number of staff that um, that is needed. Um, I'm nearly done. Just to then say, um, in terms of the workforce uh, planning context, there is um, a, a bit more of a, in South Africa, we have a public sector that serves 80% um, of the population uh, with around 500,000 um, health workers. Um, and then 20% of the population is served with around 400,000 health workers. So you can see that there is a lot of um, sort of misalignment uh, there as well. So what our aim really here in workforce planning is, is to, to help the, the ministry to determine optimal staffing levels to uh, mitigate attrition and to recruit, um, what, what uh, recruiting interventions should you have? What training capacity is required in the, uh, uh, um, with these staff? So um, on all of these, we basically look at attrition and just uh, developed uh, one simple use case. And these are the sort of steps that we are following. Um, just firstly, to say, what, do, what is the question that we really need to, to answer? And, and that year we're saying it's determining the staffing needs um, by analysis of exits and con considering who are those eminent retirees and or people who may uh, leave the department and what, what would their reasons be? Are they unhappy? Are they going to um, resign or retire? Or what is the reason for their, for their exit? 
Um, and then we needed to see what data do we have access to and um, where can we source new data, other additional data that would help us to answer these questions. Do we even have enough data? Do we have access to this data? And then to get that access was another process. We then did an initial analysis on this data. I'll just leave you another minute. And sort of these are some of the sort of um, looking at ex-employees and um, uh, current employees. Um, and this is a graph shows the reason for the resignations. Um, the bar shows the mean um, and the upper and lower quartile for each reason. We want to understand how variables uh, are the reasons, how variable are the reasons for leaving um, for each age group. Um, if you look at the second bar resignations, it shows that the mean is 38 years of age um, and the range is between 30 and 48 years of age with some outliers above 80, which could be a data quality issue. Um, and uh, this graph explores the years that people have been an employee as a service. And we, um, we wanted to know if we are, if money is a factor um, to make people stay. Uh, the education level in this is the size of the bubbles and the lower salaries, um, a lot of them are leaving earlier. So, um, and below 10 years of service, while the longer you stay and the higher salary you, you earn, the longer you are actually showing. Um, so this is really around knowledge discovery and, and understanding what data that we have. And the next steps then is to, um, uh, look at the um, um, defining the use case and decide whether we actually have a viable case to go further into this. Because it is expensive, you need to run, you need to get a lot of data, you need to spend time doing all these things. And honestly, not all data science projects are um, successful and actually give you a result that actually is worthwhile the investment that you make in it. So we decide whether in the, our early explorations, are we actually having something worthwhile to go further into, or should we just stop here and, and, and rethink um, uh, or not? Um, then what we're doing, um, the, the data engineers would usually uh, the prepared data, um, those are tasks such as data exposition, processing and governance. Um, we then go to the data scientist role of training the algorithm. Um, as described before, we separate the test set, um, more or less 20% of the data, and we use the, the rest of the data to train the algorithm. So what we did is, um, uh, if we could predict from data that we had, which employees would actually leave in the next three months or not. And through this process, you essentially iterate this training um, uh, you know, repeat that until you're happy with your, your algorithms and your model. And then once you trust your model, um, we uh, deploy it on a subset of employees of the December 2020 data, comparing the predictors, the predicted the results against what, who actually then the resigned. So we predicted who would resign in December 2020 and then um, uh, compare it against who actually resigned in 20 or who left in 2020, December 2020. Um, so you can see uh, on the left the actual employees who um, who left the department and the prediction um, of employees who are likely um, to le to leave the, the, the department. So if it is a one, then they are likely to leave. And if not, if it is a zero, then they were not uh, likely to leave. And then you can see for those who had actually left um, and uh, that, uh, you know, versus what we had predicted to, to leave. And we got a, quite a, an accurate um, uh, result there. So um, then essentially what we need to do is to display this data for management to, to make decisions. And um, this is just some of the, the graphics. 
uh, around that. And um, our next steps is to scale up the data sets um, to refine the accuracy, identify and access additional data sets to adapt the model to predict further into the future. Um, and essentially, what is the value for this? For the Department of Health, they basically can understand why do people leave, who is likely to leave, and where will the gaps be in the future? So if we have only a few pediatricians in the country and 30% and of them is going to leave, then how are they going to replace those, um, those uh, pediatricians? Because then they can take action. Maybe they could uh, prevent that attrition through a person-centric approach, plan for training or recruitment of new staff, limit the cost of the training, and uh, limit, the loss, limit the loss of domain expertise and over, their overall ability to plan better. So this is the strategy 2030 of the National Department of Health um, in terms of attaining universal health coverage. And really what they need to do is to plan for effect, efficient workforce to attain universal health coverage. And this work is essentially touching on all of these green parts of their strategy. Um, and um, yeah, um, and for us as HISP, essentially our endeavors to get into data science are growing. We are learning. We have got um, a data science, uh, two data scientists that we will have on staff uh, shortly. Um, and um, it creates new opportunities for us and adding value to our clients because we're moving away from just looking at DHIS data as data and information, but looking for that intelligence, um, wisdom and impact that we could reach with that data. Thank you. Um, just the acknowledgements. Um, for the projects that we are working that this on is a CDC project. And um, this is just some information about this South Africa. Thanks. Okay.